Let's speak to Love Bonito, a relatively new Singapore-based fashion retailer that has been expanding since COVID times. Joining us exclusively is CEO Dion Song. Good to have you with us. First time with us. Uh, how's the business going post-COVID? What are you it's, seeing? It's, yeah, it's going great, right? Today, we're the largest direct-to-consumer women's wear brand um, in Southeast Asia. We have over 20 stores across APAC. We ship to over 20 markets globally. And I would say post-COVID, honestly, I think I wouldn't say we survive, but we actually thrive through the entire period. Why, why is that so? Yeah, we have an omni-channel presence and a footprint, which gives us the flexibility, which meant that over the last two to three years, we've grown actually 40% consistently year on year. Um, I've been opening six to seven doors, actually, even over the last couple of years. Uh, despite the great performance, you are rebranding, rethinking mm -hmm. your strategy. Mm -hmm. Talk to us the thinking behind that. Yeah, I, I know we're a pretty relatively new kid on the block, but actually we've been around in the market now for 14 years, right? With a core mission always to uplift and inspire the Asian woman globally, right? And we thought that, hey, you know, it's really time for us to grow up to elevate ourselves a little bit, to modernize and freshen up the brand, mm -hmm. right? So one part of the rebranding really around brand identity, um, taking a nod to our Asian heritage and leaning into a new brand identity in a color red, right? Um, with a Asian lacquer red. And on the other side as well, actually, we really want to also share gratitude as well. And taking a proud stance as a Singapore brand, um, which is where over the last couple of months, we've infused even um, orchids as a plant feature across all of our stores globally. Um, so that's really sort of the genesis behind this right and for us it's really around hey right can we be the brand right the platform for women globally um, and provide very thoughtful clothing that's ready to live not just ready to wear what is your competitive edge because there's lots of competition out there you're fighting against the bigger brands like Zara H&M the smaller brands like uh, Shein for mm -hmm. instance and as well as mm -hmm. local brands within all the various markets that you operate in I mean what is your competitive edge indeed I think the first thing it's really around our DNA right and design philosophy it's all around thoughtfulness right and if we take a step out as well right in the fashion landscape I think it's historically also a very actually disempowering space right where fashion especially in women's wear it's all about looking great right looking beautiful not so much about form function comfort right so for us as a brand it's really around how can we authentically really be the brand for women where we combine form with function with com uh, with comfort right with versatility um, with mileage and that's really the core of who we are in terms of target audience as well since you've mentioned a couple of other brands um, we're actually really clear in terms of in, in terms of our niche and focus in terms of the audience right she's someone in her 30s to 40s right someone like you and me she's multifaceted she's busy she's not just seeking trends right and runway trends just for the sake of she's looking for versatility again right for mileage right for products that take her from day to night for example for convenience right for value for money and that's where we come in right to really produce clothing that's versatile um, that gets really good mileage right that women can wear across different life seasons of their lives as well. Let's talk about growth. You're looking at mm -hmm. double-digit growth. It's mm -hmm. been quite some time since you've posted a kind of uh, pace of growth. And yeah. when it comes to growth markets, mm -hmm. it's Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam. Talk mm -hmm. to us about how you intend to grow in these markets. Yeah, we see our growth in a couple of different segments, actually, right? One, it's really around actually a market like Hong Kong, for example, right? That we see really good sort of similarities to Singapore, right? Just in terms of trends, we've been growing Hong Kong actually quite aggressively over the last couple of years, four doors now across the island of Hong Kong. Um, across Southeast Asia as well, we've been doubling down right in markets like Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, and actually more interestingly, very excitingly as well, the Philippines. Uh, we'll be opening also our first store, a um, brick and mortar store in the Philippines in Metro Manila, um, the middle of this year. Right, so for us, very, very bullish, right? I think we see a huge potential in these markets, but for us really, especially as a scale-up brand, it's how do you also find market to product fit, right, so that you can really expand um, in a more scalable, uh, more efficient manner. It is quite surprising that you're thinking of bricks and mortar at a time when mm -hmm. digital has become the thing. Uh, why bricks and mortar? Because, you know, costs will go higher. I mean, have trends, consumption mm -hmm. trends changed post-COVID? Yeah, on, on cost, maybe, maybe not, right? So I think just taking a step back in our category in women's wear space, if we're maybe in a different category, maybe we adopt a different approach, right? And for Love Bonito, actually, we've been digitally native first and then going offline, which is actually quite unique and very peculiar, right? Perhaps to most people. Um, but first of all, in our space, we understand that 
end of the day, trying is really important, right? With textiles, with fabrics, with stretchability, it's actually quite different, right? Quite different from what a sizing AI tool can actually give you. So we see brick and mortar as a very relevant way of expanding, right? Two, when we take a step out, when we think about the women's wear landscape, it's a huge market. E-commerce cages have been high, but actually, brick and mortar and offline sales still takes up majority of the market. Right, so this is our way of also acquiring new customers, right, expanding our community, and we see it as a very relevant way of expanding. And today, is it costly? Maybe not. Right, I think we can run it efficiently. Um, today, on average, our stores have an average four-wall uh, profit margin of just under 30%, right, which is actually really healthy. Talk to us about supply chains, mm -hmm. because uh, I, if I understand it correctly, most of your manufacturing is done in China. Yes. Are there plans to diversify as we talk about nearshoring, onshoring? Yeah. How are you looking at it? Yeah, so today, majority of our factories are based in um, China. But I think what's really important and critical here, we've been building very long-term, almost, I would say, decade-long relationships with our partners in, in China. Um, and on top of that, we've been also working and diversifying. Of course, diversification, truly important. We've been working with factories as well across Vietnam um, and Indonesia. Right. I think over here, perhaps even when we talk about sort of supply chain, right? I know ESG is it's a it's a hot topic, right? So for us, it's really around very importantly how can we partner up with our factories and grow with them over time, right? So today, all of our core factories are BSCI certified, meaning they are socially compliant. Um, they have been audited officially as well um, and meet right certain criteria and standards. Mm. You had a pop-up store mm -hmm. in the U.S., in New York in particular. I'm just wondering what your international plans might be and might you need to raise funds further. The last time you raised funds were from Primavera, if I, yes. if I got it right, $50 million. For is there a need? Correct. Is there a need to raise funds further for your perhaps international expansion? Yeah, so when it comes to international markets, actually, I'm glad you asked that, right? I think what we started seeing actually a couple of years ago was that we don't just have a good clientele and community, right, of women in Asia, but actually there's a huge Asian diaspora market in Australia, Right, the likes of Australia and the US, which is why we started expanding um, more into the US market. Right? We started seeing e-commerce organic traction um, and then saw, hey, there's really a potential to really cater to women there because there are very few brands that are really speaking to um, the Asian female consumer. Right? So do we need sort of more funding investment? At this time, we feel not necessary. Right? I think the engine really works. We're able to expand very scalably through e-commerce, through partnerships, right? Right. through our KOL community. Dion, thank you so much.